All right, I think we're going to get started. First, uh, I am Assembly Member Jen Lunsford. I want to thank everyone for attending today. This is an enormous show of support for this incredibly critical issue. Um, I want to especially thank Commissioner Nyfield and Commissioner Wright uh, for giving their time, for traveling all the way here from Albany, and for all the families and advocates who have given up their time today to be here with us. Uh, I'm going to just briefly talk a little bit about why we're here. Um, Assemblymember Clark and I actually we carpool a lot in Albany, and uh, we were having a conversation one day about how often the question comes up in our office about what happens when development, developmentally disabled children or adults outlive their parents. And I've consistently seen anxiety and fear from parents who come to our office and ask those questions. So we wanted to convene the people who actually deliver the services, the people who are in charge of the policy, to have this critical conversation to ensure that all the stakeholders are at the table and we can begin the process of filling in some of the gaps that we know exist. Uh, Obviously, workforce is a huge component of this, and that's, I think, an entirely separate conversation. There are uh, incredibly important agencies, both in the not-for-profit sector and at the state and uh, county levels that perform these services, and they are at uh, alarming vacancies. We have workforce shortages across the board, um, but that's, I think, a separate conversation. We'll have a, uh, another time specifically about those workforce issues, but I did want to mention it because it's the elephant in the room at the base of so many of these problems. Uh, this year, we did um, have some big wins in the uh, budget for people with disabilities and in legislatively. One thing I'm, I'm personally very proud of, I know Assemblymember Clark is as well, we passed the Equality uh, Amendment this year, which is the first passage in a process of creating a constitutional amendment in the state constitution. We have to pass it twice through two legislative bodies and then it goes to the voters. And the Equality Amendment got a lot of press because it codified uh, the right to abortion but it also codified equal protection under the law for people with disabilities. And I think that's something that kind of got lost in the media and is worth noting because that's huge. That is a constitutional right that cannot be taken away that ensures equal protection under the law, regardless of your ability. And that's something we're committed to at the state level. That's something we will ensure gets passed this coming session and goes to the voters and we will be out making sure that people come to the polls to vote for that either next year or the year after when it gets the ballot. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Assemblymember Clark to continue welcoming everyone. But again, thank you, because without you, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do to pass the laws that help everyone. So with that, Assemblymember Clark. Hello, thank you, Assemblywoman Jen Lunsford and Commissioner, both commissioners for being here. We are so truly blessed to have your time um, with our local, both advocates, uh, service direct service providers and families. Um, it is quite rare and I heard maybe your first like this kind of event where it's like a round table, maybe. Okay, <laughs> we'll just go. <laughs> Let's call it the first. It's a, it's a, okay, because I think, um, um, like, like uh, Assemblywoman Lunsford said, it is it is how we get to some of the solutions to the challenges we know we face is convening the, all the stakeholders that have a, a different perspective or one that's important as we find address some of the challenges we have, look towards the future, make our plans. We know. Uh, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna like now. I'm like totally office of the O. OPWTT, -T -T. oh my gosh, I've said it like 50 times in the last two weeks, and I'm like, <laughs> um, is working on this five-year plan. We know that there's um, a, a future that we need to plan to um, for everyone involved to make sure everyone in New York lives the life uh, with quality and, and the way they want to live it. Um, we've, as a mom of three um, who are school-aged, I think a lot of IDD issues is what, what we've been historically focused on, which is up till 18 and it's in schools, it's, um, you know, services needed as children grow. 
Um, but we really haven't spent as much time and really the time that we need to get into the weeds on what happens after school, what happens into adulthood, what happens into, into aging, into being a senior, where do we go, what do we do, how do we make it best, how do we solve some of our challenges, how do we maybe even look to take down some of the silos that we're so good at putting up and figuring out ways to get to the, the place where people want to be, where our families want to be, where our service providers need to be to make um, their uh, services better. Um, so this is a first step. This is a very important step. We know workforce is going to be a big piece down the road. Again, I think that that's a focus. We'll have to, a challenge across our state agencies, our county agencies, our Private employers, everywhere you go, uh, workforce issues are there. But, um, you know, what's shocking is some of those workforce issues are because of care issues, right? And so this all tangentially relates to each other. One of the reasons workforce is hard to find is because people are either caring for children, parents, or those with IDD. And so how we start to address that will sort of also trickle into solutions that we're looking elsewhere. So having you all here today is amazing. This is, again, a, a start of a dialogue. We are so blessed to have the commissioner here to hear. Um, and I guess it's now at my point where I will just quickly introduce everybody in my row. I feel like I look at Chloe. Is that right? <laughs> um, and then uh, I'll hand it back to get the second row done, and then we'll kick things off, but really just so appreciative here. So first we'll start, we have Wendy McCarthy from D. Donnie. We're so excited to have you here. Really just the amazing advocacy you do on of parents and everyone. Um, Anna Casserly, who is uh, here as a family advocate as well. We won't talk about all the other amazing reasons she's amazing, mostly for giving me Brianna. <laughs> um, Rachel Rosner and uh, Sarah Mil Milko from um, Autism Up, which we both a family advocate and the CEO. We're so grateful to have you here. Daryl Whitbeck, am I saying that correctly? Um, from CP Rochester and Happiness House, excited to have you here. Angie Perez and Catherine Fuller from Ibero. Um, thank you so much for being here. Your voice is so critical. Um, as we do this, Heather Burroughs and Jenny Brongo. Am I saying that right? Awesome. It's so one funny when you read names and you am I saying that right? Um, from Homesteads for Hope and all that you're doing on some really unique ideas as we look for solutions. So thank you so much. And on my side, uh, obviously I have the commissioner to my right and she will commissioner right is to my right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a family advocate and uh, Parents Helping Parents co-lead, uh, Kimberly Dewar. Thank you so much for your time. We have family advocate, Juan Mercado. Again, thank you for your time. Uh, we have senior VP of operations at Christian Heritage, Drew Elemeyer. I've, I've said your name a thousand times and every time I'm like, ugh. Um, we have president and CEO of Lifespan, uh, Anne-Marie Cook. Senior Vice President of Operations of Lifetime Assistance, Ernie Haywood. Thank you both very much for taking time from your very busy schedules. Uh, we have uh, Kathy Paranello and Laura Wilson, the Executive Vice President and COO of Strong Memorial Hospital and Senior Counsel at URMC. Thank you again for your time. And we have um, Carolyn Flowerday, Manager of Social Work Services for RRH. And I do also want to take a moment to thank RRH for giving us this wonderful space and doing all the work. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Commissioner Nyfield. Oh, is it Commissioner Wright? With that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Commissioner Wright. <laughs> we'll cut that part out in post. Let's try. Well, thank you so much, and, and good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, first, I just I just wanted to thank um, Commissioner Eiffel and her team. So welcome, right, to Monroe County, um, and also would like to just give a big thank you to our Assembly members, um, Lumpur and Assembly Member Clark, for their collaboration to discuss just just this critical issue. Um, I'm going to try to stay with my time and read off my paper because I get very passionate and convicted on this topic. Um, prior to me becoming the commissioner here, I work for. New York State Office of Children and Family Services for over 15 years. So 
um, I have a, a very passionate um, place for child welfare and seeing how um, I'm gonna relate it to cross systems. Not I'm not just gonna put it on OPWDD. I think we have an opportunity to talk about systems as a whole and um, what we're seeing in Monroe County with some of our youth that they're coming in with so many other way um, system needs and um, layers upon layers. So. Um, as Monroe County, we're just extremely grateful for this opportunity to join the OPWDD roundtable discussion. Um, so again, I'm Thalia Wright. I'm the Commissioner of Monroe County Department of Human Services. Underneath my portfolio, um, three um, divisions that I think that speak to our conversations, which is the Office of Mental Health, our Child and Family Services, and Adult Protective Services. Um, so I, I want to just say I think we are at a pivotal time for transformational change and an opportunity for system transformation for improved outcomes for children and families. I'm sure as we go around the table, we'll hear about a lot of struggles and um, system navigation issues that many of us face. Um, I want to try to start with a different perspective around some solution-focused conversations and possibly share with you really quickly on some of the things we're doing at Monroe County to address um, some of the issues we're going to speak about. Um, so one, you know, really just excited about the opportunity to possibly create a shared vision, uh, which is going to include systems, not just with OPWDD, but with our other partner systems, systems such as OMH, OASIS, OCFS, Department of Health, SED, I can go on and on. Um, this will be the only way we can truly tackle the needs of cross-systems youth and adults. I believe first we need to identify and advance regulatory funding changes needed to maintain gains, identify gaps, and develop new solutions. We all can agree that each individual has specific needs, strengths, and challenges, and there's really no cookie-cutter approach to how we deliver our services. So there's no one-size-fits-all, and we need to be inclusive of all systems to address this crucial needs identified. We need the ability to stand up services with the lens of early intervention and prevention, as well as crisis stabilization services. Um, one thing we've been talking a lot with the state um, has been about blended funding models. Um, and we're very, very appreciative because Commissioner um, Kerry has been at the table um, with us having those conversations at the state level with OCFS. Um, we've been working together to ensure that we are identifying the specific needs of children and adults and families statewide. And by doing this, we're, we're creating what we call these um, program and need profiles, not just here at Monroe County, but what does it look like statewide? Um, in doing so, it would allow us to inventory programs that are doing the work and making strides towards positive outcomes. Um, we have this to support and provide capacity to our community partners um, and acknowledge their expertise and deep commitment to meeting these specified needs. The hopes are that we can better understand our regulatory bar barriers and statutes that may be prohibiting us to meet the vital needs of families. Um, we have to ensure that we are knowledgeable so we can have the appropriate decision making um, is occurring and that we are taking the necessary actions towards change. Um, so to pivot to a solution, um, a concern that has been constantly elevate, ele elevated is that if children are experiencing long lengths of stay in psychiatric treatment centers, as a simple example. Um, what we have started to do is engage our community-based and residential partners to begin planning on specific on cross-systems hospital discharge planning and services for youth. Um, to develop programming to serve youth awaiting discharge um, from hospitals as a like a transition step down by combining immediate crisis care and comprehensive treatment in a residential setting and long-term discharge planning, which will significantly reduce psychiatric boarding, improve the quality of life, and reduce the cost of care among youth and adults with complex needs. With this multidisciplinary approach to the decades old problem uh, may significantly worse if I can say what we've seen in the context of the pandemic. Um, there are many details related to the model, but I wanted to elevate as an example of working in tandem with providers and their expertise to building to meet the needs. We also need to identify, I think most importantly, the options for revenue support to sustain such models. We are extremely hopeful that the benefit will be savings from extended stays, um, will support families in an early intervention model, especially as we're identifying needs at an earlier age. Um, many times, right, families, as we probably hear, they're very concerned, right? The, the children are young, and what is this going to look like for them long term? So um, that burden is placed as we look at staffing resources, things of that nature that we spoke to. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Is there. What you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for having me. I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you so much to Assembly Members Lunsford and Clark for inviting me and for organizing this to your teams. Um, and to my team, I just want to recognize that I've got, um, you know, members from our regional office here today. So if those are folks that you don't know, um, I'm sure you do. But if you don't, you should know them because they're wonderful. They're the people who are on the ground doing the work every day um, alongside you, Darlene Hine Williams and Paul Stevens. Then I've got a um, team from central office here, Alexia Holden, who helped pull this together with the assembly um, members, staff, and Jessica Pigeon, who I will talk about our strategic planning. Um, and she's really our um, chief planner. So I wanted to just take a minute to recognize the team at OPWDD because everybody always thanks me for coming, but also right, I got a whole team of people um, really doing the hard work. So thank you to them. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really happy to be having this conversation with um, our family members, our self-advocates, and our service providers. Um, and I think, you know, most people know that since I started, um, I've, been, I've been the commissioner of OPW since November of 20. 21. Um, the years blend together, I think, in the COVID <laughs> world. Um, and, and pretty much since I started, I've been um, on the road, um, out going across the state, trying to meet people. Um, I want to understand the people who um, are accessing our supports and services and, and what their experiences with our system are, um, talking to providers, talking to self-advocates, talking to family members, understand what's working and what's not working, um, and also to begin to develop those relationships, right? I think that we have a lot of work to do, um, you know, both in the OPWDD system, but also across systems, right? So recognizing that that cross-system partnership is, is really critical, and as is our relationship with, um, with our elected officials, right? And, and very grateful to have um, elected officials like the ones that I'm sitting next to who, right, are involved and care, right, and bringing these conversations together to happen um, and bringing, you know, just really important attention to these issues that, that matter to all of us. Um, you know, but it's th it's through that dialogue and that partnership and that collaboration that I believe we can continue to strengthen our system. Um, and I don't think that there's anybody who would say that we don't have challenges. I think we we have a lot of challenges and we, we know that. Um, one of the things that I've come to appreciate about our system um, as I've been on the road is um, is the engagement, right? Um, Self-advocates, family members, service providers are very engaged. And when you look back at the history of our system, I think it's obvious that our system was built on advocacy, right? On the advocacy of family members um, who wanted to see better for their loved ones. And you can see that every day in the way that our system operates. Um, and at OPWDD, we try very hard to honor that um, very important role for um, self-advocates, for family members, and for service providers by engaging um, our stakeholders in, in every step of our planning, right? So not just our strategic planning process, but we meet, you know, very regularly with all of our stakeholders, um, you know, and continue to have, you know, really important dialogue about the future of our system and the directions that we're trying to go. Obviously, you know, other strengths that we have are our incredibly dedicated workforce. Um, you know, the really the backbone of everything that we do are our direct support professionals and their clinical um, counterparts who are doing the work every day. Um, you know, and we talk, you know, I've heard people have mentioned already the workforce challenges. You can't really talk about our system right now without talking about the workforce challenges. And I will talk about that a little bit because it's very integral to the challenges that we're talking about today. Um, but, you know, every day, so grateful for that dedicated workforce who continues to show up every day um, in spite of, you know, really challenging circumstances. Um, you know, despite some of the challenges, we actually have the most robust system of supports and services in the country. Um, we have, you know, the most amount of housing um, of any state um, in the nation. We have large, the largest, I think, in the, in the nation um, self-production program that provides people with a lot of flexibility um, to choose how to access services on their own, um, you know, in conjunction with their family or their circle of supports, if that's what they choose to do. Um, you know, and we're continuously striving for improvement, right? We have um, an incredibly supportive governor. Um, I think, you know, we've had the most, we've enjoyed the most support um, from, um, you know, an executive as that we have in a long time this year's budget. And obviously, thank you to the assembly mm -hmm. members as well for your support, um, right? Showed really dramatic increases for OPWDD and, and you know, the the bulk of that, those dollars are going directly to providers through the COLA, um, directly to staff through the uh, mental hygiene worker bonus, and then also to really important areas like the rates, um, 
and our housing subsidy um, will be increasing um, drastically, which will allow you know, more access to independent um, housing in the fair market. So we're really excited about that. Um, but again, like I said, you know, we recognize that we have significant challenges <clears throat> and, you know, really the greatest challenge that we're facing right now um, really is with our workforce, um, you know, which I think we've all known, right, for a long time prior to the pandemic, we were having workforce challenges and, you know, it's you know, becoming increasingly more difficult to staff our programs. And then the pandemic just, um, you know, laid waste to, um, you know, to the, the, the serious challenges that we have with workforce. I'm already getting the five minute um, warning. <laughs> I'm going to speed up. Um, so, you know, the, obviously the governor, I'll, I'll be quick about um, talking about the investments, the governor and the legislature and the, and the budget, you know, recognize that workforce challenge, um, you know, and, and made, you know, significant investments through the 5.4% COLA, which is a historic, um, you know, COLA that we haven't seen in a long time. Unfortunately, now with the, with the pace of inflation, it, it's just barely, you know, it's barely helping us, you know, um, skim by. So obviously more work to do there, but also investing, you know, up to $3,000 bonuses for healthcare and mental hygiene workers that will go directly into the pockets, um, which is incredible. And also through um, the um, American Rescue Plan Act, we've also seen a lot of support for our system and been able to flow a lot of money into the system, a lot of that directly into the pockets of our, um, of our staff. So we're very grateful for those opportunities because I believe that they're keeping our system afloat right now, which has been really, it's been a critical band-aid um, for us over the, the past year and, and really helpful in, in COVID recovery. Um, I wouldn't want to know where we'd be without those really critical investments right now. Um, you know, and many of the other issues that we face in our system are really directly or indirectly related to um, the workforce shortage, right? We need, um, you know, we need to have more robust programs for meaningful, um, you know, community involvement. Um, we need staff for that. We talk to a lot of families and a lot of self-advocates who want more, right, than a day have program um, when they graduate from high school. They want um, to be, you know, volunteering in their community. They want to be out in the community interacting with their um, with their community members. They want to have employment. They want pre-vocational support, employment support. All of that takes really talented, skilled, and dedicated workforce staff. And right now, I think um, a lot of us are seeing our staff pulled to um, meeting health and safety minimums, right, in programs where we absolutely need them, like our residential programs. And so a lot of these other programs are, are going by the wayside. And it's really heartbreaking, um, you know, to see that. Um, so again, just really, you know, that focus on the workforce um, as we're all doing, um, you know, our work over the next several months is, is I think, really important. Um, we recently, um, many of you know, published our five-year strategic plan. It came out at the end of May. It's in draft form right now. We've been on the road all summer talking to people, hearing people's feedback, wanting to understand if our draft plan accurately reflects the goals um, and the direction that we want to move as a system. Um, we've had an enormous amount of feedback. We've been very grateful for that feedback. It's been incredibly helpful. And even conversations like this, although we're, you know, technically our deadline for, um, you know, uh, comment was at the end of July, conversations like this will absolutely be incorporated and included in what you see in the final plan. And we'll be submitting that to our the governor and to our partners in the legislature, um, you know, very soon. And that will, you know, continue to show, um, you know, our partners where we want to go. Um, where we need to invest dollars, where we need to invest resources, where we need to invest um, support for our system so we can continue to improve. Um, and this is also, you know, we're coming up on the 35th anniversary of the closure of the Willowbrook State School, which obviously is forever intertwined with the history of OPWDD, right? This agency was born out of never wanting to go back to a circumstance um, that, that, you know, took place at Willowbrook. And I think every day our agency and our staff and our partners in the community are fighting um, to prevent that. Um, so, and since then we have closed, right, 20 developmental centers across the state. People are largely living in community. And I think we continue to see our system looking to mature, right? When I go around the state and I talk to self-advocates and I talk to family members, um, you know, people are talking about employment. People are talking about going to community college. People are talking about wanting to live independently and in supportive housing, right? And continuing to need to push our system to evolve, to meet the needs of individuals as they change over their lifespan, right? And recognizing that what works for somebody when they're in their early 20s may not work for someone when they're in their mid 40s and may not work for someone when they're aging and in their 70s, the same as it is for you and I, right? We need to have a system, a continuum of supports that can, you know, that can adjust and support individuals over their lifespan as their needs change. Um, you know, and really working to a needs-based equity-based system that provides people with the supports and services that they need when they need them. 
Um, and of course, you know, can't not talk about individuals um, who, you know, maybe are not appropriate for independent living or supportive housing because they have extreme challenges. And I'm looking at our partners in the hospital system to talk about this, right? And we know we have individuals who, um, you know, have been, um, you know, served and, and treated in, you know, psychiatric centers or in inpatient hospital beds and are waiting, you know, for opportunities within our system. Um, and another area that our system, you know, is continuing to need to grow and mature is in that cross systems collaboration, you know, working with our partners at OMH, working with our partners at OCFS, working with our partners in the healthcare system, um, you know, to be able to provide those opportunities for individuals who do need a little bit more support or need a little bit more um, you know, you know, clinically, um, you know, clinically complicated support, um, you know, and I'm really happy to say we have incredible partners at OMH and at OCFS and obviously our local partners as well, um, you know, willing to come to the table and to talk about that. What are the regulatory barriers for us creating, you know, dual, you know, duly licensed programs, duly funded programs. We're having those conversations. They're very complicated and I don't want to under, I don't want to, you know, undersell how complicated it is to try to manage between the Medicaid funding, the multiple, you know, HCBS waivers and sort of all those rules that, you know, um, create those barriers. But I think what I can 100% say is that you have committed partners at the state, um, you know, and I think in the legislature and I know certainly in communities willing to try to look at, you know, how do we push past some of those barriers and, and do more. And certainly we're you know, working with our partners to create those type of opportunities that can support individuals with high intense, um, you know, intensity in terms of behavior, you know, significant medical needs, um, both children and adults, um, you know, and what are those cross system solutions. Um, I could go on and on. And obviously, I'm not talking about a lot that's here on my paper, but we'll have an opportunity to dialogue. We'll talk more at the end. Um, so I'm very grateful for everybody for being here and for sharing your feedback and just want to emphasize how critical these conversations um, and your voices are in shaping the future of our system. So thank you everybody for being here and look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you, Commissioner. And amazing, amazing words to uh, hear um, as someone who is in the legislature. It's not often you get a commissioner so willing to talk about cross-funding <laughs> and cross I mean, sometimes I wonder if I say too much and I'm going to get in trouble someday, but I'm going to be like put on the internet. I hope I didn't say anything wrong. But... Uh, so, no, we love it. Um, I think so. We're going to start with um, our family testimony. Um, as I was promoting this event to, to those who wanted to participate through the, the live stream and, and maybe listen later. I was watching it get shared continually through my Facebook post. What I know more than anyone, what everyone here at the table knows is that this affects everybody, right? Somebody knows a family member or a good friend or somebody who, who's facing um, some of these challenges or has a child or, or is uh, someone who has IDD issue, uh, IDD um, in their life. Um, you know, I myself have an aunt, um, by marriage, whose who's, uh, son in Buffalo. This has been a long struggle. I've listened to her for 20 years. Um, but I know more than anyone, and I was just talking to a different family member yesterday, um, your voices are so critical to this conversation. We are, she, she called it a team um, because she was getting all these accolades for her, her work on the CDPAT program. And she was like, she's like, stop, it's not just me. If it weren't a team of government officials, agencies, and family advocates, we wouldn't get anywhere. So it starts with some of your voices, but it's really a collaboration amongst all of us. So we'll start with you. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Wendy McCarthy, and I'm with Donnie. And Donnie is really a, a provider, not a provider organization, but we're a, a membership organization. And we do work um, very closely with a robust family committee. So my comments today will um, reflect the opinions, suggestions, questions that have um, come to me from those provider um, associations, the, um, our member agencies, there's 40 of us, um, from Rochester to Buffalo, Southern Tier, Finger Lakes, and our family committee. Um, and I should mention that we have over a thousand families who are part of that committee. I'm gonna provide a very high level um, response and comment today. 
First of all, we're grateful for the support of the assembly members um, who are here today, Lunsford and Clark, who have reached out to families and providers to organize this. And of course, to the two commissioners who have um, attended today to also hear our comments. Um, we're hopeful that through dialogue, such as today's roundtable, our state leaders and elected officials will be able to work together to bring new housing and programming opportunities to individuals and provide relief to family caregivers. We believe that we will need a statewide and ongoing commitment to stabilize and properly fund programs for people with IDD. We've all heard lately about worker shortages in other sectors. Those shortages are real and we do not want to minimize them but many other businesses can shorten their hours or even raise their prices to increase wages. Providers cannot. In many cases, we provide round the clock care and prices are set by the state of New York. Um, I know that we're gonna talk about workforce issues at a separate time, but it's so important that I can't not, I can't not talk about it during this. Um, in 2005, the average wage for direct support professionals was 33% above the minimum wage. Today, in our region, the average wage for all DSPs is $16.96, and this includes people who have been working in the job for years. The starting average wage is $15.84. These figures are inclusive of providers who have raised hourly wages um, by an average of $1.50 per hour in the past year, with the ex expectation that a COLA is coming and will help, help offset this expense. Donnie's member agencies now have more than 3,200 vacant DSP positions. Vacancies in our region are down slightly from last year, but still lingering around 20%. Parents and individuals can develop a plan, but currently there's not enough human or fiscal resources available to carry out those plans. Issues that prevent individuals from securing appropriate living opportunities or necessary programs and support include inability of agencies to expand. We've heard that 61% of providers um, are unable to expand program offerings because of staff shortages. Chronically high DSP vacancy rates, high turnover, low pay for highly skilled workers. Further, the many years of fiscal cuts and dwindling in-home support services are intertwined and the outcome has been a significant step backwards for this community. Access to and availability of services has narrowed. As recently as this month, OPWDD has reported that only 200 people who were not in crisis or had an emergency need were able to be placed in homes. And, and I do think for a state of our size that this number is unacceptable, um, we need to be able to find a way to place people more efficiently and appropriately who are also not in crisis so that families can plan and know that that's a, a viable option. We're appreciative of your time and support and leadership today. We know that our voices are being heard in Albany through you. The people at this table are all of our allies, but in order to make necessary changes, we need to work together to bring others into the fold and demand a renewed New York State commitment that will provide the support and fiscal resources this community requires. Thank you. Nope. <laughs> uh, eye contact is good. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Rachel Rosner. I am the parent of two autistic young adults who both qualify for OPWDD. My daughter's 20 and my son is 24. <laughs> um, I worry every day about what will happen to them when my husband and I are gone. And I work every day to set them up to live successful lives outside of our home. As you know, everybody knows, this is not easy, nor is it simple. When doing the work of long-term planning for my kids, I've worked to build up their circles of support in the community. We've been lucky to have a consistent team for FI, broker, and care coordinator who know them really well and have been with us for a while. And the parents around the table know how rare that is. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we don't have any family in New York. And when it comes down to it, um, my remarks are going to be in the, in the weeds a little bit, as um, Assemblymember Clark <clears throat> referred to. Um, safe and appropriate housing is the most important barrier to my kids' long-term success. The action 
taken recently um, on the settings rule is a really good start, but it is only the beginning. The changes have unfortunately made a lot more work for care teams and more hoops to jump through for families. If my kids want to live at home forever, they can do that with no inspections and no regulations. If they want to live in the community, as most young adults do, the barriers are almost insurmountable for kids like mine. Um, and on top of that, then you need a solid dose of luck to make it happen in a way that is sustainable. First, we need to find an affordable apartment. It needs to be in a safe area and walking distance to the grocery store and other things because my kids don't drive. If we find one, then the care team needs to approve it with checklists and paperwork and for safety and all those other things that are really important, um, but just put up extra barriers um, and contribute probably to the likelihood that a landlord isn't going to want that extra scrutiny. Um, my kids depend on me and on paratransit, one of them anyway, um, which is limited and not reliable. The thought of my 24-year-old son living in an apartment alone, he has said he doesn't want a roommate, and that's his right. Um, but for me, that is terrifying. He doesn't qualify for 24-hour care, nor does he need it. And even if we could find staff to help seven days a week in the morning and evening, what would happen if they don't show up for work? Would my son even think to call me and let me know? Would I be able to drop everything and go to his apartment to help? And who will he call when my husband and I are gone? His care coordinator isn't going to drive to his apartment to help him, and his legal guardian will be out of state. He doesn't need or want to be in a group home, but the idea of him living in a single apartment with no built-in supports and no fail-safes is simply setting him up for failure. We need to rethink what community integration means for people with IDD. We must continue to work towards ensuring that people with disabilities are able to live where they want with the people that they want and the supports that they require. As long as we're getting into the weeds. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, four individuals can rent a bedroom in a single family home and receive their monthly housing stipend and other support services that they require, even sharing staff. If one of them lands in the hospital, they will need to share that shared support staff to accompany them, leaving their other roommates without the support that they need. If those same four individuals want to live in a four apartment building that has shared common spaces and staff, their housing stipend and other supports would be withheld because right now, OPWDD deems that an uncertified congregate setting. I know, I'm done. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, Just the beginning. Really good That's strides, and I really am appreciative and thankful to be sitting at this table and to working in partnership with everybody to make this happen for our kids. Thank you. We understand this is very limited time, and if you'd like to submit written testimony, yes. we will be happy to accept yeah. that and share it around because we know this is very tight. Too many of you wanted to participate. <laughs> we actually already have other written testimonies come our way from others. So, Kim, you're up. I'm only three minutes 30. <laughs> First of all, I would like to express heartfelt gratitude to Assemblywoman Lunsford and Clark for once again inviting and including the parent voice at the table and for genuinely supporting the motto, no decision about us without us. And thank you to both commissioners, Nyfeld and Wright for the wonderful opportunity you have given all of us today. My name is Kim Dewar and I am a parent of a child with developmental disabilities and the vice president for, of a not-for-profit parent advocacy group called Parents Helping Parents Coalition of Monroe County. My husband and I experienced tremendous concern regarding our daughter's future. What will happen to her when we're gone? Will she be supported as a valued, contributing member of our community? Will she have safe and secure program opportunities, employment, and housing? Our daughter is only six years old, mm -hmm. and her future has been a topic of ongoing anxiety-ridden conversation and a point of advocacy since she was born. And our concerns are shared by families and caregivers of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities of all ages across New York State. The fact that people need to spend 20 plus 
sometimes 60 plus years worrying about these issues and looking for solutions shows their true magnitude. The fact of the matter is that individuals in the intellectual and developmental disability community are living longer and are far outliving their parents. Aging and ailing parents are not able to support fulfilling opportunities in the community for their adult children. A lack of funding has created a tremendous shortage of direct support professionals and the subsequent stalling of the development of new purposeful programs and no new brick and mortar development of certified residential housing. With waiting lists for supportive housing in the 6,000 to 12,000 range, parents across New York State are deeply concerned. Most are terrified. We strongly urge lawmakers to work alongside us, alongside families and caregivers, stakeholders and community advocates alike, to ensure the funding necessary to recruit and retain direct support professionals, offer meaningful and inclusive community programming and employment, and provide safe and appropriate housing for our kids. Our children deserve to live a good life. All individuals in the intellectual and developmental disability community deserve to live a good life. On that topic, I encourage all of you to hear today and everyone who's listening from home to watch the documentary, A Good Life, from WXXI yes. and Move to Include. We will watch it. The film takes an intimate look into the lives of six local adults living with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families and the challenges and opportunities they face. The film quite perfectly and uniquely outlines all of the issues we are discussing today. It will air again on WXXI on October 15th at 5 p.m. I will end with a quote from Lisa Friedman that really resonated with me this week, getting prepared for this roundtable. Inclusion is a philosophy that embraces the idea that everyone has something of value to contribute and that everyone has a right to belong. Thank you for your time and we look forward to working with all of you in advocacy. You. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Mercado. I'm here today because my son has autism. He's an adult. I would like for him to become as independent as possible because I'm not gonna be around forever. Hopefully I'll be able to get some information today to help my son succeed in the future. Mostly I would like to find out what programs and services are available for adults with autism. First, I would like to thank Assembly Member Jennifer Lonsford for being so understanding, so helpful, and for bringing all these agencies together. The first time I talked to Jennifer, I told her about my son's condition, the struggle I was having, and getting services, finding agencies with agencies willing to help. She told me a lot of her constituents have the same problem and that she was going to do something about it. And if I had any problems to call her. That's nice. <laughs> which I did. <laughs> soon, after, soon after I talked to her, I, I received a call from disability, from the Disability Review Board stating that my son's benefits and services were going to be terminated mm -hmm. within two weeks because his service coordinator and his doctor did not provide his medical records to them. Yeah. I was extremely upset and nervous. Mm -hmm. I contacted my son's doctors and some agencies. They did not help. Then I contacted Jennifer. She immediately called me back and she helped me resolve the issue. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, family with special needs children and adults are going through something like this, through this a similar problem, problem every single day. I still don't understand why a person with a mental disability, such as autism 
has to do a yearly review yes all tissue is for life the miracle is not uh uh like a cold that you can recover <laughs> from it this is permanent another issue that that i want to talk about is most doctors do not know how to diagnose mental illness when my son was a child he was diagnosed with more than 20 different conditions and he will was prescribe a different medication for each condition he and they made him sick he was so sick uh consequently i decided to take him to uh, strong Memorial Hospital, where Dr. Solkis di diagnosed my son with autism. He told me that people with autism exhibit all these symptoms, and he was able to reduce his medication, prescribe the proper medication, and treatments for him, which have continued to this day. My son is going to need help some if something happens to me, I'm not gonna live forever. He has nobody else in this world. In addition to the services. Get to the best part. You can do, do the best part. Yeah, do the best part quick. Do the best part quick. Do the best part. Yeah, I got my one too. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was enjoying. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say one more thing. Uh, people with special needs, particularly adults, do not seek help when they they do not reach out to anybody for help or any agency. Uh, they, in the contrary, uh, if something happens to them, if they have if they have a problem or something, they do not contact anyone. We have to reach out to them in order to be able to help them. Uh, I hope that more can be done to help people with disability. Thank you so much. And I hope I didn't bore everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very good. All right, you're up. Okay. Yeah, you can just wrap it up. Buenos días. Buenos días. <laughs> Uh, you no, know, vamos a hablar en español para yo ayudarlos a ver si van a aprender. Thank you. Muchas gracias, mi Jen, Miss Carrie. Especially you. <laughs> First, I love all this agency. Like he told you a few minutes ago, we don't know about you guys. Because we are Spanish and we don't speak English. What do you want my family to do? You say, and one of your quotes, do you want to have the community? You never invite us. Face to Sara is the first time they invite the Spanish people. And I found Ibero because Ibero is there all the time. It's our people. That's where our people go. We don't go to that agency. We don't go to that agency. We don't go because they don't speak English. They don't only speak English. They don't speak Spanish. You call, you draw in your office. You know what they do to the Spanish people? The security guy tells, until you don't bring somebody speak English, don't come back. That's what they do to us. I go to that office over there with the big kids. I took a bunch of my kids because they're adults and they're not legal guardian of the parents and they don't know about that. Our family don't know that you can call Margaret and get your kid and get the legal guardian because they don't have, they're too busy. They don't have time for us and they don't have interpreters. Every time I take somebody, I had to go. Well, I had to send somebody on my own people to be interpreting. You agencies, they're beautiful. And I don't you agency, but they're not for us. You're not for us. I called Sarah, the other day, her office. Because I have a problem. I have a son and I have 17 kids. They're not mine, but they're my people that I work with them. I have an organization called Special Parents, Special Kids, or Rochester. 
Everybody's including my organization. Why a your organization we not include? Why I have a people speak English, speak another language? And you, none of you have in the front somebody that speak my language or any other language. That's the first problem we have when we have a child with disabilities. Second, every time, my, every child that comes from different countries have a miracle. All the Spanish kids get healed when they get here. No more artismo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle. I'm going to bring everybody from other countries and I'm going to go back with my, to my country and come back in and see maybe the, the, the disability is going. Because every person I take to the Rochester General the Strong Hospital, oh, you have to go back from the beginning. Think about your child is 12, 14, and you have to start to the beginning to do all the evaluation that way they allow you to have the opportunity to participate in OPDW. And we don't know what it is and what it stands for, but we know we're supposed to go there. But we need an agencies, especially the agency, the Margaret work, it is the one that help us to get the legal paper for our kids. That way we can talk to them when they get sick. No, we don't have that in Spanish. No, we go over there and I love Margaret, don't get me wrong. Everything is in English and I had to try every paper for my clients. Everyone. And then half of them they don't understand. That's the problem I have. Another thing, you and your office decide one day, OPD before you got there, I think, yes. They decide to get all the coordinators in one place. They remove it for all the agency and they put it in one corner. Guess what? They don't do nothing. Uh, I, before they never did nothing. Now they don't do nothing. <laughs> nothing. Like I'm gonna give you an example. Every time all the parents and all these parents know we wait for this. Okay? This is a little letter. They come with gifts. And they have a little pot too. You can go to the games with your kids. They stop giving that. All the coordinators, they don't forget about how to work. Coordinate is the worst thing can happen to a parent because they don't do nothing. They get paid good, but they show up every three months. You need to sign my paper. Every six months, sign my paper. They don't never remember who you are. And they don't know your child's name, but they come for that signature. This girl and I girl work through the through the COVID-19, 2020. Send us information, bring us baskets. She pre keep us on. In her name, can you pronounce it? Because I have a problem. Yeah. yeah. That's one agency. What happened to the other agency? What happened to uh, the one is in here that I never saw again? My son's name is in there. But he, they, he never, they never do nothing for him. CP or Rochester. No one speak Spanish over there. None. Uh, Continue, we only have one agency in here. We used to have the Advocate Center. Well, how I know, I worked for the Advocate Center. I was the board member of the Advocate Center for 15 years. And now what we have nothing. We don't have nothing for our kids. You took the Advocate Center, they used to give us workshops and everything, they all disappear. Anything that we have for our kids start to disappear. And we, you're going for a long road, sweetie, because I used to think when he was an adult, I'm going to be, this is it, you know, I'm done. No, sweetie, this is until you die, okay? And the other thing is, you're only two years old. What the hell are they talking about putting in a nursing home in a nursing place or a housing when she's only two? You, I'm not talking about you putting in a nursing home. I'm not talking about when you, you, you in a nursing home, okay? Why are you talking about putting my son in a nursing home or in a place? Let him stay in his home. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and I will say in Rochester, and I'm sure you'll hear this from my bureau as well, we have one of the largest tourism populations outside of um, uh, state, um, as well as um, a large uh, immigrant population. But we probably have the highest concentration of Spanish speaking outside yes. of New York City. Um, so it is definitely one of the reasons that we are so and great nobody speaks my bureau. But obviously, an issue of access is. 
been identified as a huge issue across agencies, not just in the IDD communities, but literally across many agencies, uh, access has been really a big no, issue. No, as we to none, none. Only Ibero, I used to see the advocates say that I have a connection with them to take my organization, but they closed and I understand they cannot do more work. But we need workshop, we need continue. Uh, give it a chance, but don't plan my child, yeah. put it in a nursing home or a placement. Because I'm not planning to put myself. I'm 60. <laughs> I'm not going. We are there. We are there. And obviously, that gets more complicated when you get into less common languages. And I have a large Farsi community, and mm -hmm. it's it's challenging. Um, but for every for 30 years, I do the same thing. 30 years in the same. Okay. I want to thank all of the families who took the time to be here today and to give us your perspectives. It's incredibly important, this conversation. Um, but we also want to move into the uh, section where the organizations are going to have an opportunity as well, because they obviously have uh, unique challenges to themselves uh, in delivering the services that families need. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, move this to Ernie Hayward of Lifetime Assistance. Yes, good morning. My name is Ernie Haywood, and I'm Senior Vice President of Lifetime Assistance, one of the largest providers of services for children and adults with intellectual and development disabilities in Monroe County. Thank you, Commissioner Neifeld, Commissioner White, Assemblyman Lumsford, and Clark for hosting this event. As solutions will require all stakeholders' understanding and collaboration. It's great that we're all at the table and engaged. I want to focus my comments on the effect the lack of planning and sustainable funding for staffing and housing opportunities has on the people and their families on how the lack of planning and funding oftentimes causes the creation, creates the crisis. Imagine that this moment when you woke up, you found your mother and sole caregiver had passed away and you're all alone and you can't be alone. So you're picked up by your care coordinator and taken to live in a large home far away from the neighborhood you know, to live with people you do not know and to be supported by staff who do not know you. As a result, you have significant reactions with what the professionals call behaviors results in having to have medication, increased staffing, and behavioral support plans. Now imagine you're a parent that as there is no other option and you have been physically assaulted and can't go on caring for your son with autism, you leave him in the emergency room at the local hospital. Once in the hospital, he is stuck as providers don't have adequate staffing and funding to meet his needs. Both of these situations are real. The last four years, Lifetime has assisted 11 people in similar situations. The current system is crisis focused. The only way these 11 people were able to obtain residential opportunities was for them to be a quote priority. They had to be permanently homeless, have a fair family caregiver who was in an emergency situation, be in a hospital or emergency room or psych center ready for discharge. In all 11 cases, the families had a plan. Their person center plan was to move into a certified housing and the families had done what we were told and placed their child on a waiting list. Additionally, additionally, for many, they had in their plans to have supports from crisis teams and to have staff come into their homes until a certified residential opportunity could be obtained. But due to, a lot of, I'm sorry, due to adequate funding and staffing shortages, agencies couldn't provide the staffing and crisis services, and so the families were left to fend for themselves. I've been doing this for over 40 years, and too many times I've been told by parents that for a parent of a normal child, the parent doesn't want to outlive their child. However, if you're a parent of a child with a disability and you have no place for them to live, you want to be, you want to outlive them. OPWDD's certified residential opportunity process by focusing only on crisis and priorities fails to be a waiting list. And it does not address supporting and planning for people to have residential opportunities that they choose and that works for them. Requiring agencies to consider people on the crow list or in crisis results in agencies having vacancies that could have gone to people on the wait list or not in crisis. There was a time in New York State's history when we did plan, when the executive and legislative branch came together to address and plan for residential needs of people on the wait list. It was called New York Cares. And the legislature set a plan, legislature set a plan in place to assure for funding to meet the needs of those on the wait list for years to come. Providers were able to work with people and their families and plan for housing two to three years in advance. Working together, the providers and families were able to transition people and avoid possible, uh, avoid crises. I have a few recommendations. One, we need a commitment to adequate sustainable funding. Providers have to be provided a permanent increase for staff wages. We need annual COLAs every year. We need our rates on time. We need to provide equal access to existing residential opportunities and vacancies. I would ask that OPW evaluate the Crow restrictions on providers to first have to consider high need crisis people in existing homes and allow providers to accept people who are not in crisis. As without placement, the crisis occurs. 
Create a multi-year plan to address wait list and true needs. As Ben Franklin said, by failing to plan, you're planning to fail. Perhaps OPW can consider hiring an independent consultant to determine the true need for residential opportunities, including looking at current bed capacity and needs down from years to come. Commit to a multi-year plan and funding similar to the way the New York CARES program operated. Fourth, provide adequate funding for people living in certified supervised settings to move out to more independent residential opportunities. Recently, OPW did release an RFA to fund supportive opportunities for people to move into certified settings. Is that a stop? <laughs> the sad part about that was that the funding isn't adequate enough to allow for the backfill people moving in and also for the people moving out of supportive settings. Again, thank you very much. Lifetime Assistance stands ready to work with everybody at the table here on solutions. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Anne-Marie Cook. Thank you so much. I want to thank Assembly Members Lundford and Clark, and of course you, Commissioner Nifel, for coming in and Commissioner Wright for this important discussion. I am Anne Marie Cook. I'm President and CEO of uh, Lifespan of Greater Rochester. Yeah. <laughs> Lifespan is an aging service provider. So my thoughts and my comments today are really from that lens. We provide over 30 programs, and one of them is called Future Care Planning Services. We do it in conjunction with the El Segal Community of Agencies and the Arc of Monroe County. And I firmly believe that this type of program should be available to all families in New York State. I have to talk about the background for this program. It's going to sound familiar from what you've heard. Future Care got started because time and time again, we saw families in crisis, and they kept saying to us, I never thought my son or daughter would outlive me. What's going to happen to him or her when they die? We took action when a 91-year-old father came to us and he said, when my son was born, I was told he died by the time he was 30. He's 62. My wife just died and I'm 91. Now what? As you know, I look at this issue, of course, from aging and typically the crisis occurred when the result of a health issue of the aging parent. The intent of future care was and still is to educate clients and their aging parents regarding planning options, assist them through the guardianship process, help them understand trust if that's appropriate, and facilitate family discussions about the future of their loved one with a disability. We don't replicate agency works, we supplement that work. I have to tell you, around the time we started, we also saw a journal of the National Council on Aging. They devoted entire issue to um, this title, When Caregiving Lasts for a Lifetime. One of the articles in the quote said, the plight of these families after all is age related. It is the aging of the caregivers that ever more urgently is driving the need for new planning ideas. It's not unusual for both parent and child to be older. We began a series of conversations with the agencies right in this room to determine if they were experiencing the same phenomenon. The consensus was they were. We needed a community solution, so we developed this planning service to assist not only the person with a disability, but also their families. We knew the legal, the financial, the family mediation and facilitation skills did not need to be replicated agency by agency. We could create this community solution and we did that in 2002. Since our inception, we have served over 2000 families. We follow up with families two years after they're given the plan to make sure they can implement it. We have an attorney with every family in court for 17 <coughs> guardianships. We facilitate these tough conversations and really, it's very different from the current life yes. plans that exist today. The problem with future care is it's a boutique service. It's only available to about 100 families a year. And if someone calls us today, they're on a two-month waiting list. We have found that scrimping at the level of service does not help families. We have outside evaluation. I'll give it to you. We have tested this. We have measured this. We have looked at outcomes. We know how this needs to be delivered, and I offer this as a resource to give to the state so other families can have this, and we need to build this better here. Families need a discussion about what's going to happen in the future. They need the legal help that future care can provide, and unfortunately, the funding's so limited, we can only help 100 families a year. Please take this data and give it to families across the state. Thank you for listening. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go to uh, Drew from Cliff Heritage. 
Thank you. Drew Bielemeyer with Heritage Christian Services. First of all, thank you to the family members. It moves me. I've been doing this work for 30 years, but hearing you, and we hear you, Anna, we do have to get more inclusive. And that's on us as much as anybody else. Thanks for my colleagues. Great to see your faces here. Thanks for everything you do. Appreciate the genuine authenticity of our leadership here really to listen and to acknowledge the challenges. I think that's new for me. Rather than defending what we're doing, really just saying, okay, this is what's real. So I want to just piggy off of what uh, Ernie said, you know, on the planning. I think it's quite obvious that we're in a reactive system, not a proactive system. And if we're really going to move to a proactive system, we're going to have to take on risk. And that's going to mean courage. So do we have the courage as a leadership to take on risk, to decrease some regulations that we've already heard here? That kind of protect people. It's built in liability, but it's not really person centered. Right. So the crop process. I would agree with Ernie. That creates unintended challenges that may not really help us in the long term. Having rates, we don't even know our rates from a year ago. It's impossible to plan, right? Even in family plans with knowing what they're doing financially. But I want to move into some more of the details because I think you have a good idea. Let's maybe throw out some ideas or some innovation for solutions, right? So let's start with technology. There's a group right now in Ohio working with Xavier University on smart living. We've mm -hmm. gone beyond smart homes to smart living with the wearables and the homes, remote staffing. They've got private pay components. We're a resource depleted industry. We always will be. If we don't find a way to bring in the private pay dollars without creating favoritism, we may be losing out on an opportunity to bring some additional resources. And technology, we don't need to chase the new shiny object, but technology is a piece of our future. And so is remote staffing. So how do we create the space to have research and development and innovation and somebody to study it and look at what's happening across the state or in other places that we might be able to adopt here and then have the courage to make the changes together across system working at it. Self-direction, right? And I, I'll send you some more information on that program I just talked about in Ohio. Uh, Self-direction, fantastic, in the sense that it gives the authority to the person and flexibility. However, it's complicated. And when we already heard about the challenges that families have, and I get it, if we want to customize a service so it can be really individualized and the person has the authority over the budget, that's going to be complicated. But we have to simplify it. Because what happens then is that we need care coordinators, then we need brokers, then we need all these other steps. And we've already heard that our workforce is depleted and the ones that are there are not really that knowledgeable or skilled. So we end up in this bureaucratic realm of frustration and now we're mad at each other rather than working together unified together so how do we simplify a couple quick things i'd say we need to eliminate some barriers the nurse practice act is yesterday's news it's gotta go we need to be able to administer medications my eight-year-old daughter can support my mom who needs a g-tube but we can't allow staff who've gone through training and are in their adult ages to support somebody to administer medication so now they're stuck in an opportunity or a lack of opportunity right and why can't we broaden who can provide the supports why are there so many limitations on family members to be a self-hire staff or a community ab staff very different in the cdpap world and it's working so um i would like to again say thank you in housing our housing stock for people who are already receiving those with the most complex needs or those are often two stories and not accessible. So the grace of God, right? And a lot of good work, people are living longer than ever, but there's not money to take our housing stock of today and transform it into the housing stock of tomorrow so they can stay in their communities with the natural relationships that have been built. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next, we're going to move to CP Rochester to Daryl Whitbeck. All right. Thank you, everybody. It's glad to, see, glad to see everybody around the table today. My name is Daryl Whitbeck. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Ability Partners Happiness House and CP Rochester. And I wanted to talk about several innovative housing options that we have developed over the last decade or so. Uh, these are three non-certified apartments with a total of 23 feet. Uh, two are located in Ontario County, one located in Monroe County. Each has its own, each unit has its own kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, living room, and each apartment complex has its own uh, community space for social activities and separate on-site laundry services. Uh, we have two, two of our apartments are our transitional apartments, which I think fits with today's discussion and looking towards the future. In those apartments, we assist individuals that are looking to transition from a certified setting to a non-certified setting, uh, and additionally for individuals living with their family members that are looking to, to move towards a more independent setting. Oftentimes that includes individuals that have uh, recently graduated from high school. Uh, 
Uh, we, we have one apartment that's our age in place apartment. It uh, serves individuals that are 55 plus with the goal uh, to help them maintain their, their placement within the community and avoid much more costly and alternative long-term care uh, settings. These opportunities are integrated in our communities uh, with the units being located alongside uh, community apartment buildings and residential homes and our host to services for individuals. Our tenant goals for service include learning skills associated with cooking, cleaning, using public transportation, getting to the stores, safety and self-care skills. Um, these are all to help prepare individuals for more permanent housing. Uh, and uh, of course, can't have a conversation without the staffing crisis. These, these models do use a staffing hub style, which allows us greater flexibility to meet the staffing needs of individuals in the face of that workforce crisis. Uh, since opening our first transition apartment in 2013, we've assisted 37 individuals. While the average length of stay varies depending on the need of each individual that, that comes to the apartments, our average stay is about 17 months. Uh, and then each, ran, each tenant has a plan, uh, an exit plan for permanent housing that they work towards. Uh, this has been a great safety net for individuals and their family members uh, as they venture into that uh, new step in life. Um, and these individuals have experienced great success with that program. Uh, given though that it's a non-traditional model, uh, we've experienced significant challenges with capital funding of these projects. Uh, we've had to rely very heavily on fundraising and grant opportunities uh, to build these wonderful opportunities for folks. Uh, we believe this, this is a great opportunity that could be replicated across the state and are willing to work with anybody uh, to further develop those programs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Heather Burroughs and Jenny Brongo from Homesteads for Hope. Hi, I'm Heather. And I'm here to represent Homesteads for Hope. 55 acre intentional community. We serve about 600 families right now, and we're at capacity. It really breaks our heart when we have to turn people away. Many of the people at Homesteads live and breathe special needs. I know I do. I'm a sister, a mother, and a professional. My sister's on the spectrum, and you know, 40 something years ago, nobody really knew what that was. Um, and advocating for her grew me into the person I am today. I worked as a school psychologist for five years before I became a mom, and as fate would have it, all four of my children have varying levels of special needs. Even with knowing the system and what our rights are, it has been an exhausting and disheartening journey. I appreciate the chance to share some of my story and my work experience today. Um, my 15-year-old daughter requires 24-hour care because of her life-threatening seizures and developmental delays. When she was a baby, I actually took solace in the fact that there were these great services that she could access. And then when she graduated from school, she'd have all these school, there's all these choices, right? I never thought that in 2022, early intervention services would basically not exist in New York State anymore. Um, or that nearly 900,000 Americans with IDD would be on wait lists for programs and housing. We're losing ground. Families have less now than we did a decade ago. And families like mine are facing challenges that are just completely unnecessary. Like my daughter's school disregarding ADA law and saying she was unworthy of an accommodation because she was nonverbal. Even with the United States Department of Justice on our side, it was an eight year federal court battle to get the school district to back down. I'm happy we set a legal precedent for the country, but I'm angry. <coughs> I'm angry because 50 years after Willowbrook, we're still facing discrimination like this. Why do parents like myself have to fight so hard for our children to be treated fairly? The laws and regulations that are supposed to protect us can be paused, suspended, or even blatantly ignored. Let me be blunt, closing down a group home without proper notification isn't okay. You're not following your own rules right now. And families are being placed in positions that none of us should be in. By being here today, I see we're acknowledging of the problem, but we have to move beyond looking for loopholes and looking at people instead, because people are suffering and we need to do something. Last year, I was forced to walk away from my state pension, my healthcare, my salary, my life's work, as the director of behavioral health at a nursing home because I didn't have enough caregivers for my daughter and who could blame them, right? $13 an hour. 
I went from helping 500 people each day to helping one person. Yes, she's my child and I love her. But the people I left behind at that nursing home, all they know is they were abandoned and something has to give. Parents shouldn't have to choose between paying their bills and making sure their children are safe. We need to stop calling this a shortage and admit we're in crisis because categorizing it as such would open the, fun, open the door to funding that will save lives. The crowding in group homes, hospitals, and nursing homes could be eliminated when our DSPs are given a livable wage. They're being frequently double and triple mandated, but even with the overtime and bonuses, they're at poverty level. And that's unconscionable. Offering DSPs training before offering them a livable wage makes the issue worse. Our goal should be to attract more staff, not to bog down the ones we have with more training they don't have time to do. DSPs are working nonstop, doing more than humanly possible to keep our loved ones alive. But mistakes are happening and neglect and abuse are on the rise and more of our loved ones are ending up in hospitals and dying of things that could have been prevented with proper care. These avoidable hospitalizations and nursing home placements cost taxpayers a lot of money and the lawsuits do too. Financially responsible and more humane to spend money on a livable wage than any other initiative right now. Our five-year our five-year plan needs to have baseline data and use metrics that are measurable. But more importantly, we need a plan that makes our workforce crisis the top priority because without staffing, nothing else matters. We are on our knees, but we're not broken. And we have fight left in us because we know if we don't speak up, we won't be heard. In between CSE meetings, doctor's appointments, and overnights with my daughter, I'm pouring myself into the mission at Homesteads. Our inclusive community <laughs> welcomes and supports people of all abilities, and I know it has real potential. And it gives me hope that my kids will be okay someday when me and my husband aren't here. And I could go on and on. But I'm going to leave with this. When people look back on this crisis, when they read about it in the history books, just like they do with Willowbrook, they will look and see who our leaders were. And it won't matter what you've said. It won't matter what you've done, because that's how we're all judged. And I pray that these conversations will help us find common ground and common sense answers because we need them now more than ever before. Thank you. Sarah Milko. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Powerful stuff this morning. It's great to hear from all the parents. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sarah Milko. I'm the executive director and a founding member of the Autism Lab. More importantly, I'm the parent of a 22-year-old son with autism. I'm sorry, I'm emotional this day. <laughs> But thank you for you to do that. You know, you putting attention to something that we all parents feel. Thank you for recognizing us that we are yeah. suffering and we still in the yeah, sense that I, I feel like I, I can't put words to it. Yes, I understand. Said, and I really, I, I, I'm, I'm going to scrap this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I did. Well, I'm going to I, I, I came here really as, um, mm -hmm. as the head of an agency uh, of a parent-led organization that we started 18 years ago to fill in gaps in services, right? Um, my son then was two years old and... Um, what he needed wasn't out there. I was, I was very fortunate to find other mothers who felt the same way, right? We built this organization, Autism Up, to fill in those gaps in services. Um, we're, we're 18 years into it, and we've worked really, really hard to provide all these programs and services for so many individuals living with autism. We've grown from four moms to 3,300. Right? And that doesn't even touch. I hear you, Juan, and I'm like, gosh, how, how have we not found you? Right? Why we don't have nobody speak right? Spanish in your yeah. agency. <laughs> we don't want people to speak Spanish. We we're gonna Only one. <laughs> yeah. Only one more. in a building. More. I need you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for mentioning my name. And I contacted you in agency yes. a few times. Good. Good. Let's keep talking. Um, we, we are in crisis. We know that. You've heard from all the parents. Um, our organization now is on the verge of, uh, you know, the last 18 years were easy, right? Yes. <laughs> they were easy. And like, and like you said, uh, the next 60, 65 years, we, we are really in for it. It's scary. We don't sleep. You know, um, our, our organization, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm emotional because it's so great to hear from all these other leaders. And maybe it's because we've been underground for two years, right? And we <laughs> haven't connected. So that's really, really important. Um, but I, I'm, I'm 
excited to work with all of these partners because I, I'm, you know, the glass is always half full for me. It's what gets me up every morning. And I feel like this is such an awesome community. And if we can all come together and continue to talk this through as a group, we can make change that I swear will be looked at on a national level. You guys can be our heroes, right? We want you to be our heroes. We can, we can implement change that's gonna make a difference for hundreds of thousands of families. And when it comes down to it, we want individuals to have everything they need. They have the right to, for this, right? And the state has the power to make these changes. And I do think that together um, we can do that. But it's time to dig deep and it's time to make sure that families are always involved. We've got to be at the table and you've got to hear our voices. And by bringing us together today, I think it's really great. Yeah. So, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Assembly members. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank all of you. And um, you know, thanks. It, it's great to hear from all the parents today. You did it. You did it. You did it. <laughs> I'm not an emotional person. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll tell you the only times I've ever cried in professional meetings as an elected official over this issue. Because I mean, as a parent of a, a relatively typical kid, not totally typical. Um, it's typical because mine not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you think about how much you worry about your kids who are typical and adding any layer of complication. It just really it gets at you. You're talking about three moms here. Um, yes. Four moms. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to move to um, Ibero to Catherine Fuller and Angelica Flores Delgado. Yeah, I have to say that I've been sitting here reflecting on what I want to say, but I, I would like to first introduce myself, um, Angelica Perez Delgado, President and CEO of Ibero American Action League. And I have to say that um, I, 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 I'm a little angry because I'm a provider who recently divested from nine residential group homes who were critical to the community. And it reminded me of the fight of equity and access and um how um, we got under this administrative wave of OPWDD that we could not rise above to the point where it really became about, do we save Ibero as the organization that advocates for Latinos across our country, or do we continue to provide IDD um, services? And, um, and I'm angry about that. Um, it shouldn't be that way. But you know, thank you to all of the people that wrapped around us Life, lifetime, who was one of the first people to, to raise their hand to help us, the Ark of Monroe, who was knee deep with us for about six months, you know, um, um, Christian Heritage, who came in at the last minute, and ultimately People's Incorporated, who had to jump in to ensure that 48 individuals had adequate culturally responsive housing. So I have to say that I'm a, I'm a little upset about that. Um, but here we are, right? Obviously, you've heard that there is a need in our community for language access, um, and you know we're 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 working really hard to focus our services in the home and community base um, realm um, for the reasons that you've heard. Because there's really nowhere else for this population that we serve to truly go. They're Spanish speakers. They're native Spanish speakers. As a Latino community. We don't go to systems first. We go to our extended families, we go to our spiritual leaders, we go to our neighbors, we go to our extended family before we land on the doors of institutions. Mm -hmm. And um, these decisions are often family involved. Everybody gets to weigh in. Um, I have a cousin who is um, in his early 20s in the spectrum of autism. His mother died of cancer. Uh, my aunt, who's elderly, has to take care of him. He's never had access to services mm -hmm. because part of our expectation as a culture is that we show up for our families no matter what. That is the sacrifice that we make. And we know that that's a trend among Latinos that is very different from our white counterparts. Um, so as we look into self-direction, as we look into this community-based services, First of all, we really need to make a create an environment where agencies like Ibero can be successful in the way that they want to be successful for their communities, not the way that the state wants yes. to be successful. Um, I hear self-direction is a great service. It sounds like it's the fastest growing in the nation. Everybody is accessing yeah, it. Yeah, but they're not Spanish. But I can guarantee you. No, 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 no
tener eso para la gente si usted, ellos no lo tienen en un idioma solo el de ellos. I can guarantee you that my people are not represented in that population. Mm -hmm. But yet, the model sounds like it's a beautiful, beautiful. wonderful match to our cultural um, implications and the way that we work culturally. So if we can get under the administrative way and just make it a little bit more easier for families of color to access that, I yes. think that we have a great place where an agency like Ibero can see itself thriving and providing services for, for its community. Um, it's, it's the decision to divest from nine, nine group homes was not an easy one. It was probably the most difficult decision I've ever made um, as a leader. But we were under an OPWDD administrative wave that we could not get out of. And it really became about the survival of a larger institution. And I just want to thank our local partners for truly wrapping around that and honoring what Ibero means to this community and knowing that Ibero was so much more than nine group homes and that we needed to continue to be the advocates for people like Ana, for people like Juan, for people who don't speak the language and continue to need these supports. So I am grateful for including me, um, Sarah and, and um, Jan, in this conversation. Very emotional as well. I wasn't expecting to <laughs> hype up, but um, that, that will be my message to you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to move to U of R, Kathy Paranello and Laura Wilson. Thank you very much. Um, as introduced before, I'm Kathy Carnello, Chief Operating Officer at URMC Strong, Laura Wilson, Senior Counsel with us at the university. Um, and we're really happy to be here today and, and hear these stories. Um, I, I think for the community partners, we work with all of you and you all bail us out all the time. Um, and for the families, um, hearing the stories has been just awesome, heart wrenching, but awesome. Um, that you do, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, as many of you, and I wanna thank, before I uh, move on, I wanna thank um, both assembly members for getting us together today and the commissioners, Neifelt and Wright. We met by Zoom um, shortly after I think you were appointed and we remain very enthusiastic with your strategic plan that we can head in the right direction on this very, very important issue. Um, URMC, as many of you know, is um, a large academic health center. We have six hospitals, nursing homes, certain patients across upstate New York. Uh, Strong Memorial is kind of the anchor hospital <clears throat> of that health system. And uh, we take care of, of many, many patients with, with uh, specialized medical as well as psychiatric needs. Um, and I am here to tell you a bit about our experience with taking care of, of persons with IDD um, under uh, many of them getting services from OPWDD, but it is in the spirit of advocacy for all of our community partners. And just to share with you a few details, over the last several years, and you've heard people talk about how it's getting more challenging, it has gotten more challenging. Over the last several years, we've seen an increase um, in the number of patients with behavioral health, intellectual developmental disabilities admitted to the hospital. In the recent four months, April to July, we had seven patients IDD, with IDD known to OWDD um, who had a combined length of stay in the hospital of 651 days. 651 days, those seven patients were in the hospital before we, one of our partners came forward and really helped us finally uh, get a decision plan. And patients with IDD, as you know, have specific needs and given the hospital environment, have required additional staff to ensure the proper care in the acute setting that is very disruptive and um, very um, overstimulating uh, for, for our patients. This extended stay in hospitals can be attributed to a variety of factors, and you've heard them uh, talked about, but I'll just reiterate them including a lack of community-based service options, which has created an environment where hundreds of New Yorkers, particularly in our region, with complex behavioral health care needs, increasingly languish in emergency departments and hospital beds, as I said, often for months. Currently, hospitals are serving as long-term destination sites for many persons with IDD who don't have um, acute um, medical or psychiatric needs. This 
uh, causes patients to get backed up in our emergency departments and not um, being able to be admitted to the hospital. So the impact of having these patients not in the community where they are best served, but in the hospital actually creates problems for people with acute medical and psychiatric problems getting into the hospital for the care that they need. Um, just want to say, I think the strategic plan for um, that has been developed has been um, really, we're enthused by that. We'd like to talk about a couple of things we think are really important, increasing access to community-based crisis and behavioral support services by providing more options for patients to be placed in community settings mm -hmm. is articulated in, the, in your uh, draft plan. We like that idea. Increasing coordination and collaboration between agencies increasing reimbursement rates that support the cost of adequate staffing that you've heard so much about, and reforming the residential habilitation rate setting methodology we think is really important. We're happy to help in any way we can. This is a critical issue for our community, and we are here to support our community partners because they have the tools, the setting, they know how to provide better care and services uh, for these individuals in our community that need to be better served. So thank you for allowing me to talk. Uh, and lastly, uh, Carolyn Flowerday from Rochester Regional. I am Carolyn Flowerday. I'm the manager for social work services um, for Rochester General Hospital, which is one of Rochester Regional Health Hospitals. Um, I'm the caboose, so to speak. So I'll, I'll give the final thank you um, for everyone um, to be, in being here and to uh, coordinate this event. I can only echo Kathy's comments from the acute care perspective. I won't repeat uh, everything that we at Rochester General and Rochester Regional do experience as well. Um, I just wanted to categorize some specific themes, maybe some um, case examples of what we um, do experience um, in this realm. Um, first, we have uh, persons with IDD present to the hospital for medical needs. Um, and it's um, realized that they have been eligible for services, but have not accessed those services. Like it's been said, um, these sometimes are um, persons that have been cared for by their families. And due to changes with the family um, unit, um, they now, uh, it's evident that those extra supports are needed. We had one such case. Um, that uh, came to Rochester General in June of 2021. It was realized at that time that we had to start uh, the linkage to um, put in referrals that would be necessary. Um, and that um, stay was 17 days for this particular person. They went home with those referrals initiated. They were back shortly um, thereafter and were in the hospital for 137 days um, because those services weren't in place yet. Um, and uh, the continued realization that those services were needed was there. Um, again, uh, due to the inability to bring it together, um, they were discharged home again, and two days later, um, returned to the hospital um, for a uh, length of stay of 160 days. Um, and at that point, uh, we were successful. Everybody felt really good because uh, she was discharged to the group home, which was what was best, um, and that group home became available. Um, second, we have admissions of persons um, that have been living in group homes, um, and they have a new diagnosis, new care needs, um, and the coordination of those new care needs cannot happen in their current group home. Um, we, we watch group home teams struggle to not uh, be able to readmit their, their resident um, and share uh, in, the, in the struggle to, to what we what do we do next? Um, we realize that there aren't enough medical skilled group homes that those persons can move up to. Um, and unfortunately do have conversations about nursing home placement um, for those, those persons. Um, one example, uh, we had someone admitted in December, 2021 from a group home. Uh, that group home was not able to continue to meet their care needs. They were discharged to a nursing home with the hope that that would be short term, um, but the fear that it wouldn't. Uh, and uh, that length of stay for this person was 232 days at Rochester General. 
Finally, I want to mimic Anne Marie's comments. Uh, we see continued opportunities for increased increased education of families and loved ones on advanced care planning, future care planning, a greater understanding of the steps and the details and the considerations um, before a crisis and serious medical uh, situation is is in place would be really beneficial. Um, I look forward to the continued collaboration. So we'll let everyone give some closing remarks. Again, this is just the first step in the long dialogue both locally here. I think what you'll learn about Rochester is we love to have our community solutions. Um, we do try to collaborate uh, across our own um, different stakeholders to find unique ways that we can serve the people in our community. But we also know that we uh, are very dependent on the state um, as well as we look to do that. But we, we do like to, to to be leaders on new ideas and new solutions. So you might hear from a lot of us often, uh, but we'll start with some closing remarks. Why don't you, Commissioner Wright? Uh, sure. Um, kind of heavy conversation. It is. It's mainly um, and care. Yeah, and um, I think it's powerful, the, the, the group you know, of providers and, and hearing the family voice. You know, we heard a lot of things person-centered, right? We heard no decision for us, right, without us, right? We heard all of these things that I can say, again, with my 20 plus years, these are not new conversations. But what I will say, I am optimistic. I am optimistic. I think we have a unique opportunity here. In all my years of government, I have never seen as much funding coming through, rather it's through ARPA, rather it's through having the conversations with the commissioner, Mr. Mase, at the state level, bringing in other commissioners um, from other state agencies to look at those blended funding models. I'll also say too that, you know, New York is not unique in this, right? I sat at the state for many years, many conferences and summits where other states presented on this issue. There's other funding models. For example, there's a state that they they assign the funding to the youth, to the child, right, to the family, right, and you get this pot of money that follows that child and family throughout their systems. And if you don't need it, it goes back into the pot, right? Again, you know, like Commissioner Nifold says, a lot of regulatory, a lot of jumping through hoops, but I think we can get there with the right folks at the table. Um, when I hear families speak, uh, especially my hospital partners, my heart gets extremely heavy as a mom. Because when my child welfare lens, I too see too many families, right? Those long lenses stay, they can't be discharged home safely. There might be other siblings in the home and it becomes unsafe. And guess what? They're traumatized now because a report, because the hospital hands are tied now and a child protective report comes in. As a system, we should be ashamed of ourselves. This is not about abuse and neglect. It's yeah. about families that need help. And then we talk about the lack of lens through the cultural and equity, the housing, right? All of these needs that we have. So as partners, we have to come together. And I, I will say, you know, just being a commissioner here with the background that I have, which I'm, I'm so humble, that I have a unique passion for this work and for these conversations. So I look forward to our continued partnership and us being the North Star here in New York and how we can kind of move the ship a little differently. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. Commissioner Nyfield, if you want to give us some closing remarks from your, your perspective as well, I get it. Thank you for your time. I can imagine you've had a lot of passion and emotion across the state. For many families, this is our children, this is the people we love the most, um, but also systems that are frustrated and, and, and don't know how to do their best services and help because of so many different challenges we face. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it is, it's heavy. It's important to be having these conversations and I really appreciate um, people's you know, courage and vulnerability and taking the time to be here um, and to share, you know, your personal experiences, you know, and, and to not be afraid, right? Some of it is hard stuff to say. Some of it is emotional stuff to say. Um, and it's really, really important that we're, we're having these conversations. So I appreciate it. And I'm just always struck everywhere we go. We had these conversations. We did these five 507 stakeholder sessions across the state. Hundreds of people showed up no matter what time of day it was, whether it was the evening or the daytime or in the middle of Midtown Manhattan or virtual or whatever it was. 
And that's because that's the level of commitment um, that our partners and our stakeholders have to seeing the future of the system um, improve. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that um, and for the partnership as we move forward. Um, you know, there's a lot I could say. I think I want to, you know, underscore and appreciate the comments around um, cultural inclusivity and diversity and equity. And that is a big focus of our work at OPWDD, um, you know, both with you know, formalizing that work through bringing on a, a formal chief diversity officer who will be, you know, leading our efforts, but also, you know, thinking about it from linguistic competence and do we have language access? We say we have language access. What does that actually look like for the people who need that access and wanting to understand? So it's really important to hear your stories about access because that, right, that informs what's happening on the ground. Um, but, but also, you know, thinking about, you know, some of the other concerns that were raised and, and organizations that are parts of communities, right, and, and embedded in communities and, and understand, you know, what, you know, cultural norms are for, you know, different families. It's very important as an organ, as a system that we preserve that capacity and what is our responsibility as a state agency for making sure that we have that in the future, because it's very important to us as an agency that we are reaching people that we no, we're not currently, right? And that we continue to stretch our reach. And we were very intentional in our 507 planning and in our stakeholder engagement around the 507 to be having those conversations with different, um, you know, cultural communities because we want to hear those voices. And I think you will continue to see this agency doing more to reach those far corners of every community so that we're hearing those voices um, and hearing from you, what do we need to do better, right? Because it's it's really, it's you who needs to inform us and we're, we're listening. And so I think, and I hope that you'll continue to see more from us in that space. Um, you know, innovation, technology, a lot of people talked about technology, the importance of technology. Um, certainly when we're talking about a workforce shortage, um, you know, it can help supplement um, and augment staffing, but also it continues to help individuals to be as independent as possible, right? When you can rely on, um, you know, uh, Alexa, right, to, to turn your lights on or to open your door for you, you know, that's the difference between being dependent on a person um, or not, right? And I think everybody wants to have the, the maximum amount of independence possible. So we are focusing both some of our partial funding and, and hopefully, you know, seeking to continue on an annual basis, um, funding opportunities for pilot programs for innovation so that we can see what works, what doesn't work, and then begin to be able to incorporate that into, you know, our waiver or our mainstream services. So it's something that we're very, um, you know, very focused on and hoping to see, you know, that we'll do better and, and do more of. And certainly housing, um, the workforce crisis, everybody touched on really, really important issues today, um, you know, that we're continuing to, you know, internally, you know, you know, advocate for having conversations with our partners in the legislature, um, you know, and I'm, I'm very hopeful, um, you know, with, uh, with Governor Hochul's leadership and the leadership at the, at the legislature that we'll continue to see important investments, um, you know, in this sector and that will continue to move forward. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, this agency is very focused on moving forward in a progressive way and a way that, that does um, acknowledge the need for some risk, right? And the ability to take some risk in a, in a controlled way, right? And, and, and allowing and supporting our, the individuals that, um, you know, access OPWDD services to also take some risks, right? Because we're really not here to, um, to be uh, protectors, right? We're here to support individuals as they do, um, you know, what they want to do um, in life. And we want people um, to have access to our, our supports and services in a way that, um, you know, supports their needs. So a lot of work to do. Um, I think a lot of cultural um, shifts to happen in our system, um, and I think you know we have the we have the ingredients, right? We've got a really supportive governor. We've got an incredibly supportive legislature. We have an agency, um, OPWDD, that is really focused on on um, you know meeting these challenges. Um, the partner agencies who are with us, right, both locally and at the state level. And obviously we've got informed stakeholders who aren't afraid to tell us what we need to do, which is really wonderful. <laughs> so um, I really appreciate everybody's um, comments today and I appreciate you being here and want to echo that this is the beginning of a conversation, certainly not the only conversation. So uh, more to come. Thank you. So thank you again to everyone who gave us your time today to RRH for hosting for our um, ASL interpreters who have been working very hard to keep up with us and to help those who are viewing this on Zoom. Uh, 
obviously, as everyone has said, this is the beginning of a conversation. And for those who felt like there were points that they didn't uh, get to make in the limited time we had, please submit a uh, written testimony. Those who are watching this electronically, um, who may be viewing this at a later time, please reach out to my office and Assemblymember Clark's office with your concerns and we can pass those along. Uh, I also want to you know, raise up our public partners who are not here because obviously OBWDD operates many facilities and uh, has many, many employees who are also in uh, you know, dire need of support. And we will work together to ensure that we are lifting up um, all of those issues with budget season uh, fast approaching. I hope that we can continue to have conversations about ways we can best support your strategic vision, about how we can support our community partners, and perhaps we can come together with some kind of unified vision for what to advocate for going into next year. Uh, I hope that we can uh, continue to partner and ensure that this is a conversation that we keep having until our problems are solved. So Four decades of conversations. Making me laugh. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. Thank you again for all of you for being here for for Rochester Regional for hosting for our staff that put this together for all our wonderful agencies. Um, you know, one of the things as someone who's been around in government for twenty years and looking at policy and how it's all done. Um, and now here doing it at the state level, there's multiple things that come into play. One, which is the, the rule of unintended consequences. So every time you make a change or every time you think you're doing the right thing, there are unintended consequences that we all need to be aware of. But also what I've learned now through the last two years of COVID is with great and huge challenges come opportunities. And I have never seen a governor, uh, state agencies, um, a legislature so willing to say, how do we turn this challenge into an opportunity? How do we be brave? How do we have courage to say we can do things differently? Um, the one thing I would leave is both the family voice here, but also understanding with uh, with you, Commissioner Neifeld, is sometimes it's not recreating the wheel. Sometimes it's not a new program. Sometimes it's just better funding and better supporting those who we already have on the ground and being able to ramp them up in a way that really takes care of the need in our community. Um, I can't thank you enough for your time, for your time and all the passion that you give to our families, um, children and everyone who is affected by this day to day. This is really a welcome conversation and I look many more um, with all of you and uh, just, I don't even need another minute. I just want to give everybody <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Also, hard stop at 1047. <laughs> <laughs> That's government. <laughs> And so yeah, no, it's so hard. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> 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 <laughs>